and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the RB Memorial Conference on Translational Research in Medicine, FIM 2022. Welcome to this track 3A on biomaterials. Material sciences describes usage of select materials for treatment or diagnostics to cater the demands of long-term relief and substitute in medicine and healthcare, tissue engineering, and artificial organs are now a reality with such biomaterials. This track is going to have three eminent speakers, Professor Ali, Professor Bikram Jit Basu, and Professor Bimon Mandal. Let me thank all the speakers for accepting our invitation and to grace this occasion. Good luck for this track three on biomaterials. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have with us Dr. Ali Khadam Hosseini from the Terasaki Institute for Biomedical Innovation. Dr. Ali received his PhD in bioengineering from MIT under the supervision of the illustrious Robert S. Langer. Dr. Ali is the CEO of Terasaki Institute for Biomedical Innovation. Formerly, he was a Levi Knight Professor of Bioengineering at UCLA. He was also the founding director of Center for Minimally Invasive Therapeutics at UCLA. Dr. Ali's interdisciplinary research has been recognized by over 60 major national and international awards. He is the recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the highest honor given by the U.S. government for early career investigators. In 2007, he was named a TR35 recipient by the Technology Review magazine as one of the world's top 
Young Innovators. In 2011, they received the Pioneers of Miniaturization Prize from the Royal Society of Chemistry for his contribution to microscale tissue engineering and microfluidics. With these words, please welcome Dr. Ali Khadim Hosseini, Terasaki Institute for Biomedical Innovation. Hello, um, I'm very uh, happy about giving this talk today about um, some of our work in the lab. Um, as many of you guys know, I've recently moved to the Terasaki Institute to uh, continue our work. And just so that you know, Terasaki Institute is an institute that um, is focused on um, really inventing as well as um, developing the future of medicine by, um, by making um, solutions through our innovations that are gonna enhance and restore the health of individuals. So it is got a focus on personalized medicine. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our bioprinting work first. Um, so why we care about this particular area is because um, if you're trying to make tissues, it's very important to make these tissues in a way that they are um, basically very much um, uh, have the same functionality as natural tissues do. So when you think about natural tissues, uh, they are not just packs of cells, um, they are actually very well controlled um, and organized structures. So one of the things that um, we do is to try to mimic these tissue structures using technologies that do that. So different tissues, as you can see here, have this microarchitecture associated with them. And um, one of the things about the microarchitecture is that it's at the same length scales at, as the cells. So over the years, we worked a lot on different um, types of things, uh, whether there would be scaffolds, of different sorts, whether they would be stereolithographic approaches, um, fluidic systems, fibers, and um, self-assembly approaches, all of them um, as uh, important ways to get this um, things, um, um, tissue architecture built. So for today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our bioprinting work, and specifically some of the things that uh, we've been doing in pushing this forward. Now, with respect to bioprinting, um, the challenges that exist are one, of course, making tissues that mimic natural tissue architecture. Um, and another one is to try to um, control and um, uh, make these multiple tissue types interact in the right way. Um, also, we need to care about the, vascul the vascularization of these tissues, as well as the viability of the cells and ensuring that the, the tissues are not hypoxic or starved for nutrients. And uh, one of the things about the technology is that we need to be able to make these tissues uh, or printers in a way that uh, they can print tissues with high speed and resolution. So these are um, clearly important challenges. A few years ago, we started to work on these problems and some of our early prototypes include things like this, where we can take uh, materials, um, print them into specific structures, put cells and materials around these specific structures, and then remove the originally printed structures so that we can generate these porous features. And these porous features, of course, um, can be made in the shape of blood vessels. So you can have these um, branching of these blood vessels. And you can take these blood vessels and line it with endothelial cells. And you can also put cells um, around these tissues. And you can observe things like having um, gradients of um, tissue viability. As, as you go deeper and deeper into the tissue. So these are um, very interesting um, observations. We have also can print the cells and materials directly. So here you see examples where we can 
have nozzle-based approaches, be able to um, move the cells um, and the liquid up, and then print them into different um, structures that we like um, based on uh, the needs of the particular tissue. Now, the whole concept with bioprinting of tissues is really in that the cells and tissues can remodel themselves over time and make the tissues that are more functional. So these are some examples of cells reorganizing themselves. And as you can see, um, initially we can have cells that are um, there for a few days um, and um, after a couple of weeks, you can see the, the morphology of these cells is very different. And as you can see in the, some of the images below, these cells and tissues start mimicking um, their behavior uh, much better. And they start mimicking tissue um, um, morphology. Now, um, when it comes to some of the things that we want to do with the technology and materials development, we want to be able to make, make both better bio inks that have better cell functionality and survival, as well as in, improve the printers um, so that they print faster with high resolution and can print multiple different types of materials. Now, when it comes to the bio inks, we've worked with a number of different bio inks over the years. Um, one of our workhorses that we helped popularize is the Gelma biomaterial, which is uh, gelatin that can be made photocross linkable. And now this um, material is widely used in the field. And also we can use other types of biomaterials. For example, um, materials that can be universally applied. So um, in the picture on the top right is an example of a biomaterial that has sacrificial alginate um, inside it. So you can mix alginate with other types of materials, uh, bioprint them, and then uh, cross-link the other material and then get rid of the alginate using different mechanisms so that you're left with the secondary polymeric network. There's also other things like conductive um, inks and oxygen generating inks, all of which are important in particular applications. So uh, just to show you um, how this universal bio ink that I mentioned uh, works, um, basically, the idea is to be able to sequentially cross-link two different types of polymers so that um, the same kind of approaches that are used very regularly for printing alginates can be used to print virtually any types of material. So in this case, um, as you know, there's a lot of um, approaches based on extrusion and coaxial extrusion of alginate and calcium-rich solution that is used to um, print alginate-based materials. Now, if you mix the alginate with a different types of polymers, like um, polymers that are photocross-linkable, then you can print the alginate structure, then use light to cross-link the secondary structure, and then be able to get rid of the alginate by uh, solutions like EDTA, et cetera. So you're left only with the secondary uh, material. Now, this is, um, of course, very interesting allows us to um, use this type of printing approach, the coaxial printing that I, I mentioned, and then be able to um, um, cross-link the material and be able to generate a range of different uh, 3D printed hydrogels that have very um, fine resolution. So this is one of the types of things that's interesting. And I mentioned that there's a basically uh, many different things that you can print with this. Now, just to kind of continue on about some of the other ways you can um, combine um, these different um, inks. Um, here you can see um, another example of uh, bioprinting uh, that's basically um, it's alginate based, but the alginate here and the material here is in the shape of coaxial nozzles. So as you're printing, you can actually print um, things that are in the shape of tubes. Um, so not just rods, but also tubes. And this can be used to make these uh, structures that start looking like uh, blood vessels. Um, you can also do other types of things with this uh, multi-nozzle structure. So you can actually print multiple types of layers. 
um, and be able to build these uh, printers on top of um, different uh, structures. And then um, we can actually start pushing these things forward. Um, so this is a very interesting examples and we've um, now adapted this to making um, these porous um, block like structures so you can actually flow different liquids through them and you can have different cells in different regions. Um, in this particular case, you can have muscle cells and blood vessel cells integrated so that they can actually make these um, blood vessel like structures. Now, um, one of the other things that I mentioned is that you can make inks that release oxygen. So we've uh, made these bio inks that release oxygen by um, having uh, materials like calcium peroxide that can be used to generate hydrogen peroxide and subsequently um, oxygen and water. Um, and we've shown that these inks can be used to maintain cell viability. So normally, as you can see here, this is a normoxic condition. You can see the cells remain viable in green. In hypoxic condition, there's a lot more dead cells as shown in the red. And once you have the calcium peroxide, then the cells remain better viable. And you can look at these types of systems. You can basically see that um, over time, you can have different oxygen levels presented here, and you can basically uh, maintain oxygen release as well as metabolic activity of cells over a range of different um, compositions based on different amounts of concentration of calcium peroxide uh, material. Um, so these are some examples of the types of things that uh, we think are very interesting. Um, of course, you can make these um, oxygen releasing um, bead um, particles in controlled shape. So you can, you can use microfluidic systems to be able to make them um, in PLGA. And based on the PLGA um, composition, we can get very not only uniform structures, but also be able to control um, based on the concentration of the oxygen. Um, calcium peroxide, how the oxygen is um, released over time. So um, we can also use these types of things, as I mentioned, with the, um, in bioprinters. And um, one of the things that we've seen is that um, we can apply different types of needles to these to extrude them. And depending on the type of um, platform, we can get different um, advantages with um, these systems. Now, one of the things that's very important to do is to generate not just inks that are um, um, of particular relevance, but also enable multi-material printing. Tissues, of course, are very heterogeneous. And currently, what's done to print different types of materials is to have um, basically printers that have multiple nozzles and you print one material with one nozzle and then you change it uh, to a different material. So uh, trying to avoid these types of things, we've come up with ways in which you can have multiple different materials get printed to an individual nozzle um, on demand as needed. So in this particular example, what happens is that you can have the the material A or B, which are indicated by the different colors, and each one can have a little valve um, that gets opened or closed with a computer. And based on which one is open or closed, you can print different types of materials. So here you can, as shown on the top right, you can print different types of materials in different layers or immediately below it. You can even have both of those materials printed in the same layer. When you have both of the channels open, then what comes out will have both of those materials side by side, allowing us to make this uh, heterogeneous rods that uh, can come out. So we've taken these types of approaches and actually been able to develop advanced printers that can have multiple different inlets as shown by the different colors here. And all of them can get um, routed to an individual nozzle structure. And based on which of these um, have open valves or closed valves, we can print these materials in a continuous manner 
and be able to get different um, inks to come out from the same nozzle. So just to show you how this works, um, you can uh, look at these two videos. Um, basically, the right hand, the left hand side shows what happens if you try to print one material and, um, and, and you start changing the different um, inks that comes out of this. And based on that, as you see in the bottom, you can see that um, these different inks can be printed um, continuously and they can be printed even multiple different inks um, at the same time. Now, the other thing that one can do is um, you can actually print um, all of these different materials, build up systems layer by layer and um, be able to uh, push things forward. Um, we push this types of printers to um, build and print different types of platforms. So here on the left hand side, you can see that um, this printer is printing different types of materials and the layer that starts looking um, somewhat like the emerging pattern of a kidney. And we can now build these um, as shown on the right hand side, be able to um, print a range of different types of platforms. Um, and of course, where we can go with this is to at, at take these types of platforms and then apply them to a range of different types of uh, materials and cells. Um, so we envision that in the future, it may be possible to actually build complex tissues using these types of structures. Now let's talk a little bit about what you can get out of these systems. So just to give you an example, uh, here is an example of um, a multi-cell um, structure in which we can take um, one cell type, in, the, in this case, um, uh, vascular cell type, and then seed um, um, secondary cells like cardiac cells around them. Um, and as you can see from these uh, picture at the bottom, you can get vascularized uh, uh, constructs that actually beat because of the contractility of the muscle cells. And um, if you look at these beating constructs, as shown in the bottom right hand image in this um, one, two, three, four spots, if you follow these spots over time, what you see is that the beating is not only consistent over time, but also if you look at the different spots, you see that the beating is synchronous. That means that the cells have started to actually make the intercellular communication and connections that makes this tissue uh, start behaving and looking like the natural heart tissue does. Now, um, if you start putting these in a dish, you get um, very robust beading. So these are uh, cardiac patches that are engineered um, and you can see that these cardiac patches have a number of different um, cells and tissues associated with them and they can um, um, beat in these cultures. As they beat, as you can see, if they're um, rolled into structures, they can actually change their diameter and um, they can roll up into particular structures. As you can see in the bottom left-hand side, if they're rolled into a particular structure that can basically pump the liquid as it contracts, then you can actually get directed movement. So if you look at the video on the bottom right hand side, you see that this structure um, can actually pump liquids and move around. So we, we got inspired by these types of approaches. And one of the things that we start to think about is, can we use this to actually build other platforms? And so this is an example of um, a platform based on a bio inspiration. So we can get inspiration from stingray or manta ray um, and uh, that kind of can flap its wings underwater and move. Um, we can build scaffolds that mimic the architecture, not just the architecture, but also some of the directionality, the mechanical aspects associated with this. So our 3D printed construct can, can print different types of materials in different uh, layers and in different geometry so that as the con contraction happens, there is a directionality to the bending of these structures. And based on that, we can actually now build um, different platforms and in this case be able to build um, platforms that can um, not only mimic the shape um, of these, you can put um, cardiac cells on them 
And then what you can do is that you can actually um, uh, see these things can move in particular ways and they can uh, move around and rotate um, and other things. And this really has become a whole field of bio robotics. There's a lot of interesting examples from jellyfish to worm-like features now uh, moving um, in these systems. Now, um, one of the other things that I like to talk about is um, some of the other applications that we can do with this platform. So for example, we can think about bone and how a bone is um, organized. So what happens with the bone vasculature is that you basically have um, these types of um, blood vessel um, systems as well as um, um, throughout the bone. And a lot of this vasculature happens through process called um, angiogenesis, which is associated with gradients of uh, molecules. So this is very important for the development of these complex bone uh, tissues. So one of the things that we've done is that we can actually generate these types of gradients by being able to uh, build up layers of these um, rod-like shapes on top of each other, such that there's a artificial gradient of some of these molecules like the concentration of VEGF, which is the um, molecule that induces angiogenesis. So we can do these and be able to now study how angiogenesis occurs in these platforms. Um, we can, um, as, as you can see here, we can also generate these structures so that they start building bone-like structures. So here um, we can uh, basically develop these and be able to um, make porous structures at the, at the core here and take mesenchymal stem cells and um, endothelial cells um, and be able to pattern them so that you can start expressing bone-like behavior as well as blood vessel characteristics in these platforms. Another thing that we can do is to build um, other tissues like the skin. Um, as many of you know, the skin is made from multiple layers. Um, there's a, a layer of typically dead cells called the stratum corneum. And directly underneath that are basically the epidermis cells um, and um, so it's followed by the basement membrane and the dermis. And the dermis is where there's a lot of um, extracellular matrix and vasculature. Um, in the um, epidermis, you typically have um, a lot of uh, epithelial um, cells like keratinocytes. Um, and one of the things about building this tissue is that you have to appreciate the heterogeneity in these different structures. So we've actually used the 3D printing approach to be able to pattern vasculature in, in the lower dermis layer. And on top of these, um, be able to um, put in, um, basically have the dermal fibroblasts so that you can mimic some of the aspects of the dermis. And on top of that, be able to put the keratinocytes to mimic the epidermis and put this whole thing at the liquid air interface so that it can generate these um, appropriate structures. So one of the things that now we can see is that these things can have um, the different cells in the different layers. So you can, um, as you go down, you basically in the top layers, you see more of the keratinocytes. In the middle layers, you see more of the dermal fibroblasts. And as you go further down, you start seeing some of these endothelial cells also emerge. So this really gives us the opportunity to now build these multi-layer tissue structures and then be able to use them to um, model drug um, development or, or some aspects of um, transport through the, to the skin, as well as numerous other types of applications. We can also use these systems to build muscle tissue. Um, and these are just some very um, early experiments showing that we can build um, layers of muscle tissue using bio inks made from different types of materials and they can be used for number of different applications. So with that said, I just like to um, end the talk by uh, mentioning that we believe that there's a lot of opportunity in this field. Um, I am particularly excited about um, some of the opportunities that uh, bioprinting enables for uh, drug discovery, personalized medicine, these 
um, um, biorobotic um, applications. And we believe that um, there's um, lots of stuff in this area that's yet to be done that um, is making the field to be fairly exciting for many years. Uh, with that said, I'd like to um, thank uh, the great people that have contributed to this work in the lab, um, as well as the many different funding sources and the collaborators um, who've all contributed greatly. So thank you very much and really appreciate everyone's time. Um, Uh, the chat box is open to the questions. If you have any questions for Dr. Ali, you can type in the chat box. Uh, Yogini Kanade, uh, can you add your email address as well? We will get back get, get back with the answers for your questions soon, as soon as Dr. Ali replies. Um, with this, we will be moving to the next session. We are happy to introduce Dr. Bikramjit Pasu, who will be taking over the next session. The chat box is still open for Dr. Ali's question. You can uh, ask the questions in the chat box. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure to have with us Professor Bikramjit Boshu from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Dr. Boshu is currently a professor at the Indian Institute of Science. He earned his PhD in the area of engineering ceramics at KU Leuven in March 2001. Following a brief postdoctoral stint, at the University of California, he served as a faculty in Material Science and Engineering at IIT Kanpur and moved to IISC in May 2011. He received the Government of India's most coveted Science and Technology Award, the Shanti Saru Bhatnagar Award, in the year 2013 for his significant contributions in the field of biomaterial science. He is the recipient of the Richard Brooke Award from the European Ceramic Society. He is currently the president of the Society of Biomaterials and Artificial Organs, which has more than 900 members across India and foreign countries. He is an elected fellow of many societies like Indian National Science Academy and International Union of Societies for Biomaterial Science and Engineering, to name a few. With these words, please welcome Professor Bikramjit Boshu from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Uh, Professor Basu, you are uh, requested to kindly share your screen and take over the session. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Professor Boshu, can you uh, hear us? Sir, your mic is muted. Um, your mic is muted, Professor Boshu. Can you hear us? Kindly uh, respond if you are with us.
um, to our audience, we'll just wait for a couple of minutes. I think uh, Professor Boshu will be here shortly. Mm. Yeah. Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Uh, so you can take over this session from your end. Yeah. So uh, my talk is for 45 minutes. Um. Yes, sir. Mm, your mm, you can your talk is for 45 minutes. Then we have a five minute session, like a total 45 minute session for you. Maybe 40 minutes and a five minute session to interact with the students if they have any questions for you, sir. And OK, um, good morning, everybody. First of all, I would, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. You're audible. Yeah, uh, so um, good morning, everybody. Uh, at the outset, I wish to thank the organizers um, for organizing this indeed a memorable uh, conference um, in memory of our very beloved, good colleague, uh, Professor Rinti Banerjee whom we miss every day, even today, and also for next several years in future. So <clears throat> I'm going to speak today on a topic which is very close to the heart of Professor Banerjee, that is translational research. He, she has done some of the pioneering work in the field of translational research on nanoparticles for drug delivery and therapeutic applications. But my talk would be on somewhat a on little bit uh, different track, and that will be more on the biomaterials and implants. As we'll progress in this talk, you will get to uh, learn some new concepts or ideas, and that is called biomaterialomics approach, which is essentially the convergence of biomaterial science and data science. Uh, having said that, this is the plan of the talk. Uh, uh, first, I'll briefly go through the biometrics and biocompatibility for just for the sake of the young students. Then it will be followed by lab scale research to prototype development. Here I'll show you very, very different examples followed by biometrics, new concept, and some of the applications of the biometrial mix approach followed by translational ecosystem concept and example. Now definitions. Um, biomaterial is a unique class of materials with proven compatibility with the components of the living system, means protein, cells, bacteria, tissue. And what you see in this cartoon is that a eukaryotic cell, which is truly nucleated cell, which is truly nucleated cell, is adhering and expanding on a, on a material surface through the formation of the focal adhesion complexes. And if you see the focal adhesion complexes, which are formed and which is essentially shown here as, as, a, as a red dots here, these are nothing but a cluster of the cell surface protein, the cell surface receptors, and then proteins, different type of proteins, which are absorbed on the biomaterial surfaces. Now, through these focal addition complexes, that material the cell establishes uh, strong attachment with the um, uh, synthetic biomaterial surface. 
And at this point, you know, these two things are very important to distinguish. That is, one is a implant and one is scaffold. Implant essentially is three-dimensional solid structure with much better mechanical properties and at the same time proven biocompatibility properties, which are used to reconstruct the damaged tissue organ, whereas scaffold is a three-dimensional porous architecture. And because of the uh, large volume of porosity in the structure, the scaffold also is expected, so the scaffold has much better biocompatibility because they will encourage more tissue formation, which can grow inside into the scaffold architecture, and that will lead to better biocompatibility than implant. So the property which it distinguishes biomaterial from other classes of materials is the property known as biocompatibility, and it is a holistic property which renders a biomaterial with most appropriate beneficial cellular or tissue response for targeted clinical application. Now, therefore, if a material which is, which is deemed to be biocompatible for cardiovascular application may not be biocompatible for orthopedic or bone, uh, bone replacement applications, because for both these applications, different types of cells need to function on the biomaterial surface and <clears throat> that makes it uh, biocompatibility uh, to a large extent or application specific. What you see in this cartoon is that when an implant is placed in an, um, in an animal, um, in an anatomical location um, in a full organism, then what will happen, this is that protein, these protein molecules, they will get absorbed on the biomaterial substrate and that will be followed by the recruitment of different cell types like macrophages and so on. And these macrophages, when you start interacting, then they will start sending um, these cellular signaling processes, and that will eventually lead to the formation of extracellular matrix. And this extracellular matrix with proteins and cells together, that will form a collagenous bag around the implant. And all these processes are extremely slow, and it will take at least three weeks, um, three to four weeks. And that is the reason an orthopedic surgeon often tells the patient to come back for a follow-up after three to four weeks. So uh, now, um, so, so uh, from the preceding description, it should be very clear to you, a biomaterial should have, uh, we should, uh, should support the protein adjustment process. At the same time, should facilitate the cell addition, cell proliferation, and cell functionality modulation. At this, but in terms of this blood components like red blood cells and platelets, a biomaterial should not um, disturb the morphology, disturb the morphology, or should not cause significant morphological changes or destruct these RBCs in blood. And in the context of prosthetic infection, a uh, biomaterial is not expected to facilitate the bacterial colonization on the synthetic surface. Now, in terms of the cell material interaction. What is very important for you to re recognize that you know that a biometrial substrate should um, should allow these proteins to get absorbed on the biometrials uh, on on the surface, and you, you can see that this will be followed by the cell surface receptor and then protein interaction on the biometrial surface. This also will subsequently facilitate the cell morphological changes on the biometrials, and here the role of protein is very important. Now, what you see the clinical applications for biomaterials and implants for human health care, and what I what I always describe it is a head to toe uh, kind of application. And if you start from the head, you know that bone flap craneoplasty. I'm going to show some examples of our clear translational research in that area. Then comes dental implants, then cochlear implants for the for <clears throat> for the treatment of the uh, hearing disability, ocular lenses, cardiovascular implants. Then if you go down this body, then go to the total hip joint replacement, knee joint replacement. These are like, you know, some of the articulating joints where materials, uh, synthetic materials are, off, are regularly placed to for the joint repairment. Then cardiovascular applications like pacemaker and various uh, like cardiovascular stains and so on. There, the titanium alloys and nickel titanium shape memory alloys are used. Then bone fixation for the if a um, uh, if a person got some injury due to the accidents, road traffic accidents, so on. So it's for bone fixation, stainless steel plates are used. 
Now, in all these applications, what you see that fundamental to this, the all these applications is our understanding on the biomaterial science. Now, what are the foundational scientific disciplines? We have engineering and physical sciences on one hand and medical and biological sciences on the other hand. Now, both these disciplines lead to the development of implantable biomaterials and our understanding of the living system components respectively. Now, at the much higher level, it is the interactions of the living system components with the implantable biomaterials that will constitute the central theme of the field of biomaterial science and which is essentially at the crossroad of multiple disciplines and primarily two disciplines. One is the material science and one is the bi biological science. And then other, other sub themes are more emerging research area like manufacturing science, particularly additive manufacturing, biomechanics, toxicological science, veterinary science. They will continuously contribute to the development of the field of biomaterial science. What is most important for you to recognize that it is the medical sciences, it is the unmet clinical needs which drive the development of, <coughs> of biomaterials with better functionality, with better clinical acceptability and so on. And that has much, much larger relevance to the, field, uh, to the human health care. Now I shall give you some of the uh, few, some of the examples which are largely from my from the research of my own group or in collaboration with clinicians or other groups uh, around India. This first one is a bioceramic femoral heads for total hip joint replacement. Now here I must mention that we have not developed any new materials, but we have used zirconite of and alumina, which is already used as a femoral head component. But what is the novelty of our work was that this is part of our collaboration with NIT Raukela, Devashi Sarkar's group, that we implemented what we call integrated computational materials engineering or integrated computational material science and engineering approach, which allow us to predict the center density and grain size at any intermediate process processing conditions. And what are the things that we have varied is the sintering temperature, sintering time in one hand, and material variables is a zirconia content, magnesium oxide content. And we use that response surface modeling approaches, um, which is essentially multi, which solves the multivariate problems where uh, the center density, uh, these coded values for A, B, C, D is being fed as an input on the right hand side, and that interaction terms are also put as one of the uh, third or the fourth term on the right hand side, and there is an error term, and then it will allow us to predict the center density. And if you see the prediction capability of this response surface modeling approach, particularly in the context of this GCONDRAP and alumina, which is very good because that R score and RMSE is fairly uh, very, very, very acceptable. Now, what is the beauty of this response surface modeling approach? Now the parameter that we what we optimized from this response surface modeling approach that not only uh, that that not only gives us very dense component for the coupon samples like 10 millimeter or 20 millimeter samples, but also same combination of sintering parameters were utilized to develop uh, or to fabricate femoral head and acetabular liner components. And if you look at the three dimensional architect, three dimensional microstructure. Uh, which is being um, uh, which is obtained using microcomputer tomography analysis, you would notice that there is a very good distribution of the zirconia particles as a second phase in the alumina matrix. These materials have also exhibited very good biocompatibility both in the animal model and also hemocompatibility with the rabbit blood, particularly less than 5% hemolysis, which we have recorded in the rabbit blood. So this was the manufacturing scheme that we have uh, that we have implemented again in collaboration with uh, NIT Raukela. So we started with a CAD design. Let's say we started with 28 millimeter femoral head. Then we uh, then, uh, then we fabricated the green body. Then we very carefully done the machining um, at the green state. That is followed by the pre-sintering and final sintering. And with that we get very good uh, femoral head with good sphericity as well uh, with, with good sphericity and good dimensional tolerance. 
And these particular uh, femoral head components also have shown clinically acceptable burst strength, which was measured using a customized uh, test feature. Um, a test fixture. The second one is that uh, <coughs> polymer planes that we have what we have uh, used is that HDP and UHMWP. Now, traditionally, most of the acetabular or all acetabular liners, they are essentially uh, manufactured from this extruded rod followed by the machining to get different sized components. So what we have done, we have utilized a uh, new concept called polymer blend because UHMWP cannot be injection molded because of the very high molecular weight and resultant high viscosity. So when we, when we mixed or when we blended with high density polyethylene, <clears throat> their viscosity is lowered. And further, we have added very small amount of graphene oxide, but graphene oxide dispersion polymer blend is not an easy task. So we have, uh, we have done some polyethylene grafting and on the graphene oxide, and then that allowed us to disperse this graphene oxide in this polymer blend. And now these materials have good osteoblast compatibility as well as the uh, blood compatibility, and we have done uh, osteointegration in the rabbit model. So this is that part of the subsequently, we are using uh, that commercially used design features, which, you, which we have got in collaboration with one of that implant manufacturing company based in Gujarat, and who sells this uh, acetabular total hip joint replacement devices around the world. And then we have also benchmarked the properties against a striker implant. So what is new in this context is that manufacturability, establishing manufacturability using that injection molding technique. What we are working with one of the uh, globally reputed uh, manufacturer based in Bangalore that is in the MM Private Limited. And from more from scientific standpoint, we are trying to implement machine learning approach to accelerate the implant design. Particularly, we are introducing the different design features and trying to understand which particular design concept will lead to uh, we uh, will lead to uh, clinically acceptable bio biomechanical response in the bone during different gait cycles. And here, machine learning model is uh, currently we are trying to adapt. And this machine learning model takes the three different input parameters in terms of the bone condition, subject weight, and implant design. And then output parameters are essentially maximum principal strain one and maximum principal strain three. What you see in the right hand side, you can see the predicted value and true value. That is very significant correlation in terms of the R square can go up to uh, between the training data and learn that um, and, and this uh, the R square goes around 0.393 to 0.95. The next case study is on more on the additive manufacturing in the uh, 3D printing and 3D bioprinting of the materials. If you look at the top panel here, so we have we have been working on the binder jet 3D printing, which allows us to uh, print the biomaterials at physio physiologically relevant temperature that is 37 degrees Celsius, and also uh, uh, we do not need to use uh, the laser beam or electron beam uh, during this 3D printing uh, b b b during the 3D printing. So what we have added to the literature is how this binder internalized into the powder bed and how this binder infiltrates what is the spatiotemporal kinetics and and this we have done further using uh, uh, synchrotron study at the diamond station diamond light station in uk in collaboration with brian darby's group at university of manchester so what you see in a fraction of second how the interface position is changing with time and that has been modeled using using the established theoretical model. And then we have further, further uh, developed a new modified model to fit our experimental data. Now we have used this titanium six aluminum four vanadium as a model material to implement that new binder uh, formulation scheme. And then what we have found that we are able to get very good viable modulus, which is, which is kind of a modest number. It is like eight uh, for a material which has 28% volume porosity and 98.4% interconnected pores. And these materials also support good osteoblast and fibroblast cell functionality on the materials. 
Next, coming to the 3D bioprinting or extrusion based printing. Here, the idea is that we are trying to target that whether 3D printed material can be used for this peripheral nerve, nerve regeneration as the concept is being shown right in below. And we are using continuously uh, that one of that ind indigenously developed 3D, uh, 3D bioprinter by Ovai Biosciences. But the fundamentally, we are trying to develop new bio inks uh, with a good printability and buildability property. And we have used gelatin methacrylate. And normally, people use gelatin methacrylate of 10%, 15%. We are currently trying to use that whether lower uh, percentage of the gelatin methacrylate can be used, but we can still achieve a uh, reasonably good combination of the mechanical and biocompatibility properties. So translational research not only means that we develop new materials, new treatment options, but also uh, it also involves some of the new machines which are very which are used for uh, which are used for uh, driving that tra translational research. Now here you can see that how this nerve conduit should be printed with the gelatin methacrylate based materials, and here we are able to achieve that 20 millimeter long nerve conduits and then structure is fairly stable. Now we have compared the performance of our indigenous uh, printer with that of that Envision Tech Germany that this particular machine is recently installed in our in our uh, uh, in Indian Institute of Science Bangalore and you can see that this is a little bit different kind of materials which is gelma and also carbon nanofiber based materials and we can see that how these materials are being printed in a uh, as per the CAT file that we have uh, given as an input. So next we'll see that you know that we are trying to promote through our research some of the startup companies in India. And one of the prominent example is that Ovai Biosciences. We have uh, we have customized their first generation bioprinter and which they are going to commercialize very soon. I'm not sure whether this uh, particular movie is coming uh, there but we are developing their business model and then also commercialization approach. We are trying to establish and we are trying to help them. And this is that particular movie on this Ovai Biosciences printer. What you can see, that you can see that there are some of the most attractive features of the bioprinters, particularly pneumatic based extrusion, as well as auto calibration mode. Okay, next we'll move to that cranioplasty. Hello, there is some background noise. Yeah. So, so next we move. Hello, there is some background noise. We request all the participants to please mute your mics Which while he's talking. Arjit, Arjit Bhattacharya. Yeah, we have mute. Yeah, we, yes, have sir, we have muted him. You can carry on. Sorry. Yeah. yeah so next we'll uh, give you some, some more examples where we have uh, worked in very close collaboration with the uh, uh, surgeons. And one of the example is the cranioplasty study. So this was the collaboration with <clears throat> several neurosurgeons from two or three different hospitals. Uh, one is at Ramaya Medical College and another Dattam Medical Institute of Medical Sciences. And currently we are also collaborating to establish more scientific basis or more um, and, and, and to get more clinical insights in the cranioplasty in collaboration with Dr. Manish Baldea from Jaslok Hospital, Mumbai. Now, what is this, uh, what is the background of the cranioplasty? Now, <clears throat> traumatic brain injury, that happens to a patient either due to the stroke injury or, or brain tumors, when the brain tumor is removed, 
during certain surgery to surgical operations. Now, this reconstruction of the skull wall defect is one of the most important things, and this reconstruction is pursued by a surgical operation known as a cranioplasty. So what surgeons used to do, they used to use this autologous graft, which was supposed to be the gold standard for many years. But in recent times, we are trying to see that whether 3D printed cranial flap or bone flap can be used to reconstruct this cranial vault with good aesthetic outcomes and also clinically acceptable neurophysiological outcomes. So this is the clinical study we have done on 15 patients so far, and more patients are being recruited at Datta Mek Institute of Medical Sciences. So after getting approval from both the partner institutes, as well as clinical institutes and academic institutes, we started doing this research for at least two years ago, or two to three years ago uh, in 2019. And then when we started recruiting the patients, so what we used, we used at Indian Institute of Science is that very extensive analysis of the CT scan data from the patient using 3D slicer and mesh mixer. And subsequently, uh, to, uh, subsequently, we were able to delineate the morphology of the cranial, uh, morphology of the um, morphology of the cranial defect here, both in terms of size as well as the thickness of the bone flap that we have to reconstruct. Subsequently, we have used FD approved polymethyl methacrylate bone flaps and we have implanted to the patients. This is one of the indexed patients you can see that is a very large defect, so the large defect size of around 120 centimeters square. Then we have put this bone flap. We could reconstruct this page, uh, the, these patients uh, or bring, bring back the cranial symmetry within three to six months of the time period. And the Glasgow outcome score is, uh, was acceptable. It is around 4.2 to 4.5. And cranial index of symmetry, which is based on the measurement of the defect area from the pre-operative CT scan and post-operative CT scan, it is around 95%. Now you can see that um, <clears throat> you can see that this is the operation is going on in an operation in an OT in one of the Bangalore-based hospital with a three uh, uh, with a polymethyl methacrylate based bone flap, and these, um, uh, these uh, neurosurgeons are placing on the patients cranial flap, uh, uh, and then they have completed the operations. And then after that, what we have seen, that we could see the neurophysiological functionality was restored after a few days. Okay, now moving on to this, uh, more into the cranioplasty, what we, have, what we have understood that this cranioplasty or cranial bone flap has to undergo you know, several evolution. So currently we are we, uh, we have evolved from first generation to second generation to third generation that patient specific synthetic implants using 3D printing technique. Now what we believe that fourth generation cranial implants would be when we'll implement artificial intelligence algorithms and trying to see that depending on the patient CT scan data, what should be the exact bone flap size and shape that will give the best cosmesis outcome uh, after this bone flap is implanted into the patient. Next, we'll move on to the dental implants. And I'm showing all these examples where you can see very clearly involvement of many clinicians and also some of the companies as and where we have reached out to those companies and the project is in that kind of matured shape. So in the case of the dental implants, we have formed a team of the key opinion leaders, as well as, uh, um, as one startup company that is Ortho Medical Devices Limited, private limited, that's based in Hyderabad. Now, if you look at that, some of the numbers. So currently, uh, Indian mar India is the fourth largest dental implant market in, in, in Asia, and more than 5,000 dental labs and more than 300 dental institutions are working. Uh, many of them are working in the field of the uh, dental restorations and dental reconstruction and so on. Now, most of the dental implants which are used in Indian patients is all imported, except one or two uh, most recent um, uh, indigenous implant manufacturers that have come to the market. So what is most important if, uh, for you to realize is that uh, these implants have certain design features, and, the, and, and these implants are mostly which are used in patients is a sandblaster and acid that will give 
certain surface toughness on the implant surface. Now, what is most important in the dental implant development is how you introduce new design concepts. For example, in that ISC, we have designed a hybrid external thread features in terms of that initial, uh, by by initial part of the implants, we have this micro V threads for reduced marginal bone loss. Then comes our deep buttress threads that will give the implant better primary stability. And towards the end, uh, end part of the implants, we have provided the bone cutting active threads and that will allow us to implant even the most difficult site during the surgical operations. Now, as opposed to metallic implants, we have also designed very recently single piece ceramic implant, and that is what we call is a tissue level implant. And in the tissue level implant, so here we don't have this abutment screw and all this together, but it's single piece dental implant. And we have a non threaded region that is for the more soft tissue integration, followed by micro square threads, that is a cortical bone integration, and V threads for integration with cancellous bone. Here again, we have we have given towards the end the deep bone cutting V threads. But next we'll concentrate that what we have taken further towards the clinical studies is our metallic implants, which is essentially FDA approved uh, grade five titanium six aluminum four vanadium. We have done all the stages of the implant manufacturing. We have completed the preclinical study in rabbit model as per the ISO 10993 guidelines at Suchit at University Institute of Medical Sciences and Technology. And for all the studies, we have benchmarked against the stroman implants. And if you see, this is the intraoperative views where the implant is placed in the rabbit condyle. And this is the extra radiograph just to show that implants is placed very perfectly. Now, if you look at the histological slides, uh, stroman implant versus ISC implants, you can say that ISC implant because of their, uh, <clears throat> uh, because of the innovative thread features, they could engage that woven bone much more intimately compared to the stroman bone. So that leads to baser, on, baser osseo integration and more quantitatively better uh, bone to implant uh, length. So uh, next we'll show you that, you know, what is, what is the mechanism for the better osseo integration of these ISCs, of ISC designed implants? And there is a phenomena which is called as a contact guidance mechanism. What is this phenomena? Phenomena essentially means these micro threads, they will, they will engage the, or they will favor the initial cell attachment to the group surface, and that will be followed by the cell spreading. And this will be subsequently, this will subsequently allow the cell migration and alignment, and essentially will allow the more orientation in the direction of the cell orientation in the direction of the groups. These contact guidance mechanisms essentially will involve the osteoplast, which is bone cells. And you can see in the top that how the cell spreading and cell alignment takes place in a much more schematic fashion. So what is the present status of this dental implant project? So we have gone, we have walked through uh, several miles. Now we are currently at this uh, large volume manufacturing at our implant manufacturer at Hyderabad. And also we have, uh, we, we, uh, we have got approval for the clinical study. We have got approval from Clinical Trial Registry of India for the academic clinical study, which will be conducted at King's George Medical University, Lucknow, uh, Ramaya Hospital, as well as the uh, Dr. of Medical Sciences. Next one, it is that hydroxapatite. Hydroxapatite derivatives are used for a multiple biomedical applications across different surgical disciplines. And Tata Steel New Materials Business, they have, um, they, um, they, they have started a new, uh, <clears throat> new business verticals called Medical Materials and Devices, MMD. And these Medical Materials and Devices, they are essentially commercializing many of the most widely used biomaterials, which will have, which, which, which has to undergo large volume manufacturing in a very certified and regulatory manner. And I have been helping them in, uh, in you know, establishing the large volume manufacturing. And you can see that we use the start tank reactor in a pilot scale manufacturing process. And then currently this hydroxyl powder can be uh, developed in indeed like 150 to 200 kg per month. 
and this process after the after the start tank reactor it will go through many of the post processing steps and one of the important steps which will give rise to granulation or very uh, large volume powder and subsequently we have we have allocated some by coating and impurities so what is the impact of our research as i showed in the very beginning of my lecture that in terms of the head to toe applications of the biomaterials what we have done we have developed the bone flaps customized bone flaps or patient specific bone flaps for canoeplasty surgery dental implants implants for musculoskeletal reconstructive regeneration and what i have what? not shown because of the uh, time constraint is our work on electric and magnetic stimulation for regenerative bioelectronic medicine and also urological neobladder and what is our dream our dream is to develop biomaterials and implants right in india and so that where currently more than 75% imported implants are used and this will allow these biomaterials and implants to reach across different cross sections of citizens of india as well as in num as well as large number of medical tourists who come to india from different african nations as well as many of our neighboring nations like nepal bangladesh bhutan pakistan um sri lanka and so on so now i'll move on to describing one of the new approach what i promised you at the beginning of my lecture that is called biomaterialomics approach so what you have seen in the several of the examples that i have been uh, telling you for last 30 minutes or so it is that when you start with a defining clinical need it goes through lab scale development in vitro testing pre clinical study prototype manufacturing and this particular slide essentially describes the different stages or steps in this translational research in the context of the dental implants and finally when we go to the regulatory clearance and then when you go to this implants is packaged with labeled and certified this implants will reach the patients so all these steps if you see that quantum of data that generates that is progressively reduced and with a high volume data typically people produce either in vitro in vivo testing but at the same time you have to realize that if you go from left to right the clinical significance of research or clinical significance of data is fairly high but what is what is important for you to note that typical this product development cycle takes somewhere around 5 to 10 years but we need to accelerate this development and what is the approach the approach that we propose is a biomaterialomics approach what are the different terminology materialomics essentially means combinatorial combinatorial approach to integrate to integrate experiments and modeling so this particular approach was essentially propagated first by marcus builler from mit and clemens van vlieterswick who is currently professor at maastricht university in netherlands subsequently cranford also proposed biomaterialomics which he brings they bring more this biology aspects but all these things all these approaches essentially were discussed in the literature without the use of data science tools and then comes Barack Obama's famous announcement of the material genome initiative from White House a few years ago where the United States they emphasized a lot more on the implementation of the data science tools for the material science development and deployment so what is material material essentially as i said that it is essentially combining uh, the material properties on one hand and their biological response so if you look at these different material properties on the left hand side here and then if you see on the right hand side the transcriptome that different genes how these different genes are upregulated in a manner dependent on different property attributes that was the central theme of the concept of material so what we propose therefore the biomaterialomics should be at the should be should define the convergence of the data science on one hand and biomaterial science in another hand and biomaterial science what are the key elements here that i have mentioned like uh, what are the chemical properties of the materials toxicity biocompatibility surface topography electrical mechanical properties and so on in the biological omics 
there are different um, uh, there is uh, uh, this large number of data sets can be generated by different investigations like genomics transcriptomics proteomics clinical and imaging data sets that will constitute a large data sets indeed for many of the clinical translational research and what i have uh, shown in the bottom that i have shown a few slides ago that product development cycle so what are the key elements in the biomaterialomics so therefore the key elements in the biomaterialomics on the one side you have this biomaterials development essentially high throughput prototype library biocompatibility assessment in vitro then performance assessment more preclinical studies and preclinical studies on the other hand more computational study like in the biomaterial science although is although this is not pursued to a large large significant manner like density functional theory molecular dynamic simulation finite element analysis is however used more significantly than other computational tools then comes data mining like metadata management machine learning so these are some of the things which are slowly being utilized in the biomaterials community but not to a significant extent i must say then comes the e platforms where you know different kind of online platforms and databases which which can be potentially used to develop this biometrics approach but which are not used as of now <clears throat> so some of the uh, limited attempts which are made in in application of data science in the biometrics field and one or uh, one of the example is the glass genome although i must say this glass genome case uh, mauros group from university of pennsylvania they have used this uh, data science approaches for uh, for predicting the manufacturing related attributes performance limiting properties and mechanical properties of the glasses which are particularly used for non biomedical applications so the biocompatibility part of this component is missing in their glass genome analysis and they are this one of this um, one of the work by sunny etel they have published this quite a few years ago in advanced healthcare materials where they have shown this materials library once you prepared this materials library can be used for establishing the cytocompatibility and also they have they have they have propagated the idea that you can develop some molecular descriptor based on the material property and here they have used the antibacterial property markers where um, they have particularly used that what is the number of rotational bonds in this particular polymers and then what is the hydrophobicity to bacterial cells and then subsequently they have used the computational model and then find out that you know what kind of materials that will be uh, that will have very good combination of antibacterial and biocompatibility properties so <clears throat> this is the work from carl simons group from nist gathersburg where they have used in the mouse model that combinatorial cash uh, combinational cassettes where they have put that hydroxypeptide tcp that is biphasic calcium phosphate with and without with and without uh, with and with with, uh, with and without um, uh, human bone marrow derived stem cells and they have put the different uh, 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 different materials and they have put it in the cassette then they have done primary surgery and then we have uh, then they have put this bone score and then in this bone score they have found out in a very high throughput manner that what is the of which particular material composition gives rise to better bone regeneration but again this is one of the unique work but this this kind of work is not very widely followed so far in the biomaterials community now in terms of the clinical data accessibility that can be a very very important roadblock particularly in the biomaterials and implants and most of the clinical uh, clinical databases they contain these results from the drugs drug uh, drug study and drug screening study for example vivli is one of the uh, well known uh, clinical databases where they have the 4000 clinical uh, clinical trial data sets then clinicaltrials.gov that is also one of these another another sites where all the publicly and privately sponsored clinical trial data data sets are placed and are um, <clears throat> are cited and there is some other data sets other databases also i have mentioned about the eoda that is from yale university and clinical study data request there at least 3200 patients data sets are stored 
So in case of the Fibli, this is that one of the non-profit organization in Massachusetts, and they are they are they are putting like 4,000 clinical trial data sets. Now many of these data sets can be utilized for predicting the clinical data outcome for a given implant or given materials. However, whenever we are developing new material or new biomaterials, it is very likely that their clinical performance has not been investigated a priori. So therefore, there are different challenges we need to address, particularly how to fuse experiments and modeling. And in the experiments part, we, we generally develop huge or significant experimental data sets. But we have to utilize some of the uh, physics-based modeling approaches. And these physics-based modeling approaches will give us better predictions. And then particularly, we have to see that how biocompatibility aspect needs to be integrated with that by leveraging Bayesian interference, interference model uh, for this, you know, more for better reliability and better predictability. So <clears throat> this, I'll go to that next is the data analytic tools. What are the different data analytic tools people are using? In the material science, this Python or uh, PYMKS repository has been quite widely used to establish the process structure property linkages, PSP linkages. There is also regression that is very commonly used machine learning based approaches, which are used for accelerated delivery of the high entropy alloys. And that has been predicted in one of the very new uh, policy related uh, notes or policy related books. Then deep learning together with other computational approaches, although they are used in a very limited ex extent, but they also showed a lot of promise, particularly when the data set is very small, because in many kind of clinical cases, your data sets may not be very, very significant. So deep learning based tools can be very useful in those kind of uh, scenarios. So I'll just give you some examples. So machine learning in, in, in how it can be adapted to predict the material properties. For example, you develop these different compositions of the same kind of material classes from material one to material N. So there are some uh, properties and these properties are also measured. Let's uh, take the example of the string elastic modulus and then maybe biocompatibility compatibility properties in terms of the cell viability and so on. Then you can learn these data sets and then subsequently what you do, we have that one is a training data set, so one is a test data set. And from the test data sets, you should develop that your ability to predict. And in this process, one can use the different algorithms. And commonly used algorithms are mentioned here, like KNRS neighbor, support vector machines, uh, random forest model, decision tree model, and so on. In one of our most un one of our unpublished work. We have used some of these uh, machine learning algorithms where, as I said before, that we are we are trying to predict that what is the biomechanical response of the differently designed acetabular liner components. So in the case of the cranioplasty, as I said that, you know, that we can use these uh, machine learning based algorithm approaches, trying to see that how how fast we can uh, we can develop our predictive capability of the bone flap size, shape, and their cosmesis outcome in an accelerated manner. So what I have not discussed, as I said before, is a bioelectric regenerative medicine approach, regenerative engineering approach. And where we have done, when we have grown that human mesenchymal stem cells, when you exposed to electrical stimulation, then we, we are able to demonstrate that these human mesenchymal stem cells can undergo differentiation either to bone cells or to cardiac-like cells or to neural-like cells. And in all this process, we have found out that very specific gene markers can be upregulated. And in line with the genetical stimulation, we have also done magnetic stimulation, stimulation just to show that they can be also utilized similarly for this um, osteogenesis application. So what is more to do in this field is that we know the biophysical stimulation of what is the biometric parameters which are of relevance. What we don't know that how gene regulatory networks are being activated and being upregulated in when we apply this biophysical stimulation approach and, and also whether they will have significant influence the way the proteins are absorbed on the biological surface. Now, these are the things which we can investigate by combining both system biology approaches and artificial intelligence models so that we'll have better predictability whether if we apply the specific biophysical stimulation that will allow either to osteogenesis or myogenesis or cardiomyogenesis. 
otherwise we have to we have to carry out uh, the long experimental protocols and long experimental procedures before establishing that what kind of pathways you are activating by using that um, um, by using the biophysical stimulation so all this biometric mix approach which is essentially bringing together data science uh, data science concepts and tool sets with the with the biomaterial science knowledge and and then data will essentially lead to what we call 4G biomaterials, the fourth generation biomaterials, where we'll have the predictive capability, and this predictive capability is essentially uh, facilitated by the digital twins, and which will also see the fusion of high throughput experiments, multi-physics models, and data science approaches. So this is this is the dream, and this dream has to be accomplished in next few years' time. So I think I'll close my talk just to show you some of the examples of the translational ecosystem. So in India, we are working in academia, in the different IITs, ISC, NITs, and universities working mostly on the lab scale development. We need to work very closely with some of the national labs, some of the CSI labs, the GLP testing facility, some of the DST labs have the regular ISO. Um, some of the DST labs they follow, like CG Technology Medical Science and Technology, they follow many of the ISO standards in the preclinical studies and the and then and then in vitro studies. So these biometrics and implants and clinical perspectives, this in the top panel you can see that we have to form a close collaboration with the medical universities, dental clinics, and national institutes. And then comes a manufacturing ecosystem which needs to be revamped and which needs to be strengthened in the years to come, particularly in the biometrics and implant space. And we should have more GMP compliant manufacturing where we can have design validation, sterilization packaging, and pre-market acceptance. And then comes in the testing and certification space where we should have more enable accredited labs and regulatory consultants where we can get this regulatory approval and manufacturing license will go through this manufacturing ecosystem. So this is that Indian translational ecosystem in the biomaterials and implant space. We have these several government agencies, private sponsors and national societies which are working and they not only support in terms of the financial support, but also they support and they help in growing this particular field that SBI particularly as I'll be speaking after um, after an hour or so. Then we have the multinational companies, MSME and startups. There are different companies which are which are mostly many of them are MSME and some of the Tata Steel new materials business they are coming in a big way. They are like you know multinational companies. Then we have different medical hospitals and universities they are doing the clinical studies and then we have a large number of academic research groups which are primarily doing more lab scale developments and many of them they are engaging constantly or more continuously with the manufacturers and in clinical institutions to take their product to the or to take their technology to the next level and here many of the national institutes like SCTMST plays an important role and i would like to acknowledge various sponsors for our research references and I would, uh, these are the group of very motivated young researchers who are who have worked in my lab in the past who worked in my lab in the past and who are and some of them are working currently in my group who have contributed very immensely to the development of our scientific understanding and also translational research in the space of biometrics and implants and some of them are currently working in some of the iits or nits as faculty members thank you very much for your kind attention Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for your wonderful talk. So we just open the forum for um, two or three questions. After that, we'll move on to the next session. If you have more questions, you can post it on this chat and we will. Um, Dr. Basu will get back to us at, at the right time. So uh, we have one question in our chat box from Hemant Vijay Kumar. So uh, Hemant, if you are online, you can yourself uh, or speak to Dr. Basu. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is Hemant I am from Clemens's group, and we were the ones who coined the term materiomics. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for uh, uh, you know touching based on our work as well. Briefly, right, Hemant. Yeah. We became the topo tip platform. Presently, I am in Singapore working with Duke U.S. Medical School. Uh, my question to you is: uh, Where do you see uh, this uh, AI 
based machine learning algorithms for biomaterials discovery going forward uh, because as you said uh, when we start up uh, and uh, with in vitro work we have quite a lot of data but uh, when we go to patient trials we don't have so much data so where do you see this going uh, in the future and uh, uh, how do you see uh, this getting really translated into clinical outcome very nice question hemant i mean i mean indeed actually I, I when writing this paper for acta biometria we have gone through so much literature uh, particularly uh, i think your phd advisor and that bitter sweet yeah uh, now now he is at uh, masfit university so what is the challenge here it is challenge is that people use different cell lines people use different cell types in the in vitro models and also many of the cell studies they do they are not they do not necessarily involve all the gene expression analysis or the specific gene expressions analysis for that particular application so we need more data also at the in vitro level more reliable data more statistically validated data which can be used in this particularly biometrics approach the next in the patient clinical studies again clinical studies are more as i said is more uh, publicly available for the drug screening for the different new drugs and all but not that much available in the open public or publicly accessible databases yeah, around the world so what what we need to have that this many of these bibli web uh, bibli portal and many of this portal they need to collect more clinical data sets or clinical or, or clinical results or clinical outcome results from different studies put it together and make it available to the public then we have to see how we can put this data let's say for example of the dental implants or let's say for example of the acetabular liner which we can utilize it in that uh, using the different machine learning model so what we can do, what i can say further that for example some of the computational analysis results like finite element analysis they can produce lot more biomechanically relevant results which can be utilized using the machine learning algorithms to see what kind of biomechanical response an implant can have which has known which is known to be biocompatible so that biocompatibility analysis is not required but only that if that their design features are need to be changed then we can essentially predict that what kind of design features introduce uh, what is the magnitude of the bio biomechanical stresses and their distributions and so on so that can be also another approach but there is lot to explore in the in the, uh, in the future uh, it is true that you know that your team has coined this term material means but some, i unfortunately i don't see many of the groups worldwide are following uh, this approach in real in in implementing those kind of concepts in this particular domain that's why i i was very happy uh, to attend your talk and uh, uh, to see that uh, you know the work is going forward in some way or the other and that too by another indian so that's a really proud feeling another thing is uh, one of my student ex student akilesh agrawal is joining you your lab uh, soon as a phd candidate am i uh, correct yeah yeah that's right yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so he did his internship with me uh, so see. we can catch up later over email or something oh sure uh, sure definitely look definitely definitely looking forward to yeah um, thank you uh, thank you hemant for the this thing so we need to move forward i think definitely professor basu will be in touch with you so thank you so much uh, so we'll just take one more question if there is anything from the audience then we'll move on to our next speaker so is there any other questions from the audience for professor basu okay i think that's all i think, I think that's you. all from the audience if you still have any questions our chat box is open till 1 pm for all, for this entire slot so please post your questions with your email ids here and thank you professor basu once again for a wonderful talk and we hope to stay connected with you thank you in the day oh thank you so yeah let me start sharing
Uh, sir, please stay with us for the poster presentation. Should we? Sure. Yes. Join me in welcoming Professor Iman Mondal, this from Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. Professor Mandal is Associate Dean Academics and Professor in the Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, School of Health Science and Engineering, and for Nanotechnology, IIT Guwahati. He is an acclaimed researcher and was featured in the world's top two person scientist list prepared by Stanford University in the field of biomaterials, regenerative medicine, 3D bioprinting of human tissues and organs. Professor Mandel is also an associate editor of ACS Biomaterial Sciences and Engineering and editorial board member of Impact Journals. He is the new president of STERMI. Recently, he has awarded the prestigious Swarna Jayanti Fellowship and S. Ramachandran National Bioscience Award by DST and DBT in Life Sciences for the year 2020 2021. His research areas include biomaterials and tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, and targeted drug delivery systems. Please welcome Professor Viman Mundal, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. Uh, am I audible? Please confirm. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A very good uh, morning to all participants. Indeed, it's, uh, it's an honor for me to be part of this. Uh, Memorial uh, Conference on late Professor Inti Banerjee, and I do join with all of you in remembering her fondly for the contributions uh, she has made to the science, the translational science in the Indian and global scenario. And I mean, I know for me it was always, uh, uh, I mean, an, an experience of uh, handholding that I have got from her since the day I have you know, come in contact with her through the meetings and the invitations she and sent for uh, some of the conferences which she has organized as a speaker where I talked. And of course, on, on the numerous occasions we have met uh, across uh, the you know, board where we have interacted. And she's always been, as we have been listening throughout the morning that how uh, encouraging she was uh, to all of us uh, in terms of uh, how, uh, you know, in giving direction and uh, and, a, and a helping hand to youngsters like us in, in the directions for translational science. And this lecture, what I'm going to give to you in terms of the work that we do at IIT Guwahati, which is on the translational front on healthcare, is dedicated to her. So with this, I would like to st uh, start my today's presentation. And uh, it is on the topic bioengineered human tissues and organs, uh, uh, the way forward in healthcare. And as said, I belong to uh, IIT uh, Guwahati uh, as a faculty. And since last 10 plus years, I'm, I'm here serving and working in the domain of healthcare. Now, uh, tissue engineering is a topic which is something which is very exciting. And a lot of speakers, previous speakers have talked about uh, the scope and opportunities which tissue engineering brings to us. It is about uh, the folklore as well as you know the concept of rising from the ashes where stem cells has the potential uh, to regenerate and not only the organs and the tissues but you know it can be used as a tool to engineer these organs and tissues uh, in the laboratory and that is what our laboratory works 
where we are trying to develop many of these uh, implants, transplants, which can go into patients and saving their life. And this is very important because unlike the lower group of organisms, you know, lizards, planaria, amphibians, which uh, themselves can regenerate uh, a lost part or an organ, we unfortunately cannot do that. So we heavily rely on uh, opportunities where this can be created in the laboratories. And you know, as said already, tissue engineering is a highly interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary field, which uh, uh, looks into uh, using knowledge and opportunity across the boundaries of, of, of uh, subjects, where each subject has a great role to play. And the culminating, culminating, point, uh, culminating point is uh, in terms of developing these organs and tissues to serve humanity and, and patients who are in, in need of that. So before I you know, uh, embark on, on, on sharing with you the work that we do, this is a gist slide with the pictures of my students, graduating students who have immensely contributed uh, for each one of the topic which we have touched upon. Of course, because of paucity of time, I have around 40 minutes to talk about. So this lecture it would be mainly to give you an exciting peek uh, into the domain and different uh, objectives uh, uh, that we have undertaken and and give you uh, uh, share with you the updates and the latest that we have where we have reached and how we are progressing. And of course, I will be missing a lot of the work that we do. But uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, I will I will stick to uh, overarching uh, and, uh, concepts. Uh, and of course, details are available in the published papers. And of course, I'll be available during the question answer session as well as over email if you have any further questions too. Uh, no, uh, inquire uh, from me. And uh, without taking much time, but again, tissue engineering, as we have time and again known, it relies heavily on the workhorses, which are the cells, which can be of various origin, from differentiated cells to progenitor cells, stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, which do the function which we want them to do. But again, they, they are needed in plenty, and, and that for the reason we have to grow them in vitro, and expand them and then uh, comes the role of uh, polymers both natural and synthetic where these are to be grown on a template called the scaffold because the cells cannot form three-dimensional you know, uh, 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 structures by themselves we rely on these templates where onto this uh, the cells would be grown matured in a bioreactor environment and finally the implantation would happen so this is a typical cycle of tissue engineering that uh, any of the engineering bioengineering labs go through in order to develop any of these organs. And as I said, uh, we heavily rely on cells, which are the living entity. And like us, they have their wish list in terms of the nutrient, in terms of the requirement of, of substratum, features of the substratum. So uh, this is a very important core area where we are looking into where not only the material properties, but also the physical chemical properties, which guides these cells to be grown in a template, as I said, so that the template would harbor, harbor the cells, allowing them to proliferate. And with time, they would erode out and leaving behind a mature tissue and an organ, uh, which would do the function. And another very important aspect what we look at or what bioengineers look at in, in terms of the dynamic uh, stresses what the body looks at or what the body feels. So our human body is not a static system, but it's a dynamic uh, entity, and we are constantly under uh, different forces, uh, you know, are a mix of forces. And it is very, very important. It has been realized that apart from the other components, uh, you know, giving share or the uh, ample dynamic uh, forces, uh, the cells see, and this helps them to mature uh, to the desired uh, level for the expression of both in the genomic as well as the proteomics. And that is very essential in terms of attaining a functional tissue or an organ. Now, uh, another aspect that we look at and what has been realized over time is the concept of form follows function. Now, uh, this is something which is very, very important in terms of all to all. This is a, a message to all the budding uh, researchers who are aiming to work on the concept of tissue engineering where not only the external morphological dimension, but the inter internal hierarchical buildup of a tissue or an organ is to be understood. And why the reason is because if you look at nature, if you look at the organs and the tissues we are made out of, every one of them has a definite structure, a form, and a hierarchical buildup. And this is for a reason because it has to do the biological function, it has to bear the dynamic forces, 
and so many other you know uh, 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 aspects that it has to look at and so nature has evolved itself in terms of the organs to have something which is optimally functional so if you are to replicate if we are to replicate any one of them to attain efficiency to the efficiency of a native organ we have to you know without uh, deviation uh, replicate those architectures and that is what we do uh, uh, in our laboratory so as i said um, the field heavily invests on on or dependent on on materials for the cells to be grown as as a template or a scaffolding material there has been numerous materials which have been utilized and the most successful ones being the natural extracellular matrices like the collagen and so many other matrices which are available uh, 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 in plenty and with time it has been realized that there are alternate uh, materials uh, which are available which can do the job uh, in 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 similar fashion but in, uh, having uh, a lot more advantages in terms of being cost effective and many other properties which i'm going to briefly talk to you so here in this uh, aspect we work on work uh, using silk and uh, yeah, this is a very unique material in our laboratory across the globe is one of the niche uh, laboratories where we are working on endemic indian varieties where we 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 use silk both from uh, the worm as well as the cocoons and 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 use the purified protein uh, to be used as a scaffold and as i said the silk being a protein material the biggest advantage is that it is totally degradable protein means it's it's the building blocks are amino acid and we have the necessary enzymes in the body which can cleave it into amino acids and the residual is utilized by the cells themselves as fuel as a nutrient source and so there is no waste product that is one big advantage another biggest advantage is that immunologically they are well tolerated it has been already in you know, one form like bombex modi has been uh, given fda approval for the fibers so it is well back compatible non immunogenic and and uh, the one big advantage for non bulbary silk which is the endemic silk you know and uh, one big reason for me uh, uh, being at iit guwahati is the this this part of the country is blessed with lot of these endemic varieties muga eri and they have a rgd binding site which is a cell binding site as we all know so this allows cells to proliferate naturally without being chemically tweaked with those factors and 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 that helps to complete the regulatory cycles uh, you know and reaching to the market much easier uh, in terms of getting the regulatory approvals uh, because it is more of a greener method uh, i know that what we have experience and of course they are abundantly available and relatively inexperienced compared to collagen the purified collagen of 10 g which is a few thousand rupees and 10000 or plus rupees uh, silk you know a purified silk would be a few hundred rupees only so the whole purpose of of telling you is this because if we if we have to cater to a wider audience which are from developing nations under developed nations we have to develop this concepts and tissues and organs and implants which are very very affordable so pricing is very very crucial if we, if we are to reach to all all needy and uh, material pricing e contributes immensely in terms of this technology so if you cut down on that uh, by hundreds of time so you can develop uh, you know uh, uh, affordable technologies of course not compromising on the functionalities and that i am going to demonstrate to you another feature of silk is this can be molded into various formats so that it can be done into different shapes which is very essential and using different techniques what has been sh been shown here in the slide we do create different formats for the cells to grow now this is very essential to choose the right uh, technique because as i said form follows function we have to form the form i mean create the form i know if it is nanofibers or uh, mesh or uh, composites uh, replicating the dimensions and architecture of the native tissue for the cells to sit on so uh, we do using all these techniques and recently we have heavily invested on utilizing 3d bioprinting so like 3d printing which uses a polymer and extrusion based method 3d bioprinting is uh, unique in its own way where it uses bio inks or polymers which carries biological cells and uh, what the concept is is about uh, taking uh, dimensions of the traumatized organ or the part one can create the dimensions one can fit it to the computer which is a 3d bio printer it will process into grids and then we can print precisely down to few hundred microns resolution using biological cells so that allows living structures to be created very very precisely 
and that is what we do in our laboratory and and, and this allows uh, very precise architecture as i said to be created and really it has revolutionized uh, the entire uh, domain of tissue engineering where earlier we had to rely on custom methods for replicating these finer architectures which was most times very not not easy of course repeatability was also an issue now with 3d bioprinting in hand we can create living structures and maturing them and then you know any of these organs and tissues can be well built so with this uh, uh, background I'm, I'm going to take you through through some of the projects that we are in working in collaboration and in funding from uh, various sources so first is uh, on the bioengineered blood vessels. As we all know, blood vessels carry uh, the blood uh, to from the heart to the farthest part of the tissue. And uh, because of occlusion, uh, deposition of cholesterol, what we know as, I know there are uh, I know, uh, 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 opportunities or problems of atherosclerosis, heart attack because of this blockage. Now the gold standards are valium angioplasty, vascular stains, which are put into uh, the blood vessels to clear off this occlusion. But uh, once that uh, is uh, not the possible or the viable option, then the patients are going are, go are are taken to bypass surgery where the blood vessel is replaced with a saphenous vein, and uh, that is what through the open heart surgery. Now, there is a constant shortage of blood vessels, particularly narrow diameter blood vessels, where we, where we, we looked upon whether we can create these narrow diameter blood vessels using silk as a biopolymer, where the dimension would be 2 uh, mm diameter. Now, now, what the whole idea was, of course, you know, it was, I mean, all what I'm going to show it to you, you know, within a few slides uh, is actually each one of them has been uh, worked upon for six, seven years, you know, with a lot of failures and a lot of optimization. But I'm going to only give it to give to you or share with you the final outcomes. So here what we have developed is a, a vascular graft, which is a, a porous graft, as you can see in the left hand side and with a electrospun mat to allow high patency as well as to have resistance to burst pressure because of the blood pressure that we have. Now, we, have, we, we looked at two approaches. One was the cellularized where we wanted, uh, uh, we seeded stem cells, outer lower stem cells, and we, we differentiated them and to create blood vessels, which was more on the cellularized part. But uh, we realized over time that that is a long drawn process. So, and also there are a lot of limitations. So instead of that, we thought, can we have something which is acellular and which can recruit cells from the native blood vessels where the implant has been and uh, sutured in uh, during the transplantation. So with that concept, we had to optimize the material quite a lot to allow the cell cellular migration to happen because that was the key essence for that. So with that, once we implanted in the animals, we have seen the extracellular matrices to be, you know, grown like, for example, alpha smooth SMA, calponin, one factor, elastin, collagen, you know, through the HNE, we have done all, all the assays, all the functionality assays we have found that the extracellular matrices by these cells recruited by from the native tissue was very much in, 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 uh, you know, alike the, the similar to the native blood vessels where this graft was implanted. First, these were uh, grafts were implanted into the rata water through microvascular surgery. I'm going to show you two uh, videos here. One is the occluded uh, graft, and you can see when this uh, uh, dye, uh, you can see when it is injected, you can see there is a blockage in the central portion and the dye cannot flow out. When uh, our grafts were, in, uh, were implanted into this occluded region, you can see uh, you can see the graft can, you uh, know, the uh, the dye can pass through very, you know, uh, easily, showing that the occlusion is cleared. The animals were revived and they survived for a few months' time. Post-operative, all the animals, you uh, know, except uh, barring one or two, survived, which shows that uh, this procedure is possible in the animals. Our our grafts were patent. There was no uh, acute thrombosis that was observed, no cases of hyperplasia. So giving us the courage that, you know, and the excitement that, you know, these these are very much, you know, uh, viable graphs, two millimeter graphs, which can be tested further, which we are doing now when more animal models before we embark upon to take it forward to the clinics, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the times to come. So this was the story about the blood vessels, which we are now taking forward. And this was work by Prerak, who has uh, completed his PhD, is now doing postdoc in US. 
Next is the story about uh, beating cardiac patches, work by Shreya. She completed her PhD. Again, uh, she is at IIT Kanpur as for a postdoc as a, you know, uh, uh, and, 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 and what the whole concept was here, can we mend a, a, a ailing heart in terms of uh, ischemia because of low oxygen uh, uh, availability? The, there is necrotic core, there is dead tissue in the cardiomyocytes, you know, the heart muscles do not beat in any and leads to a lot of secondary complications. We again, this is a work of seven plus years where we try to invest that uh, can we instead of, you uh, know, which is the gold standard where, you know, cellular therapy stem cells are injected at the site, but again, there are possible uh, uh, difficulties in in allowing or remain letting the cells remain at the site when the cells tend to migrate off. So the concept of cardiac patch came where you know a lot of researchers across the globe were trying to create a patch which is a beating cardiac patch. In this direction, we also invested a lot of time and with a thorough understanding, we have now created a cardiac patch which is 3D printed as you can see in the slide, which which uh, where we have indu used induced pluripotent stem cells as the progenitor cells which were differentiated to cardiomyocytes. You can see through the staining where we have matured cardiomyocytes. We have done a lot of uh, biocompatibility assays in vitro and in vivo and proved that these materials are totally compatible. Also, we realized that two aspects. One is the beating uh, 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 has to be in similar to the human beating rate of 82 bits per minute. And second was if we develop cardiac patches which are bigger, smaller is okay, but in to have a viable cardiac patch, you have to have a bigger cardiac patch of one to two centimeter across, then the survival uh, or integration is very critical because blood vessels are not there. So what we did here, we printed both uh, cardiac patches aligned with the blood vessels. You can see Huvex cells were used and we printed them through the cardiac uh, uh, patch that we have created. So this is a slide, uh, no, a gist of the work where we can. We are, I'm showing you the cardiac patch on the left side, where you can see the cardiac patch, you know, which is a robust structure. It is. It can be implanted at the myocardial infarct region for for gaining back the functionality. Top, you can see the cardiac cells which are beating in unison, and we have got uh, beats of 73 beats per minute, which is very very close to the human beats of 80, 80 to 82 beats per minute, which was very very exciting for us. Now we are going for animal studies where. You know, the whole purpose is to create a myocardial infarct model in, in the animal and then, you know, uh, go for the surgery and then, you know, uh, look at uh, the outcomes of it. But, you know, as of now, the, 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 the research outcomes has been, or the results has been very promising for us and we are looking forward for collaborators, you know, in terms of taking it forward to uh, uh, in a more matured state. Next is a work on bioartificial pancreas to treat diabetes. Of course, now not the entire pancreas, but we know that uh, diabetes is something, particularly type 1 diabetes, which is insulin dependent. And because of its being an autoimmune disease, our uh, the patient's own immune cells uh, attack the islets and the insulin producing cells, so the beta cells cannot produce insulin. So that is the problem statement. And of course, uh, we realize that synthetic insulin injections, that is what the patient's heavily rely on and they have to prick themselves constantly and that is what is the life of a, a type 1 diabetes patient. Now, having understood the problem statement, as I said, being an auto uh, autoimmune disease, so we realize that the immune cells attack the ILS, as I said, and they kill the beta cells. Now, the problem statement was, as you can see in the slide, the bottom part where the concept was, can we deliver ILS through a minimally invasive method at the site of the belly? where it will be integrated and connected with the blood vessels. But the challenge was, can we have a semi-permeable membrane where they would allow all the nutrient and the insulin glucagon hormones which are produced to go out uh, go out from the islets, which are, which are embedded, but it doesn't allow the immune cells. So it will be a semi-permeable layer that would be created. So that was the problem statement that we had. Also, the challenges was, of course, a lot of researchers are working on islets and you know, and, and, and making them functional. So challenge was, can we have uh, islets which can be tra no, um, transferred to the minimally invasive route uh, through the gels? Also, can we have stem cells which can be differentiated to uh, islet-like cells which would produce this uh, no, insulin, glucagon and other hormones uh, from uh, as, as an autologous source because that is very, very important for patients because they do not have the functional islets. So with this in mind, after a lot of uh, work, you no, know, it's it's again a seven plus year work with a lot of uh, permutation combination. Now we have developed a gel which is a silk silk gel, 
which is a crosslinker free gel which we use using two varieties of silk we play with the physical chemical properties and with the cross linking natural cross linking we form a gel which is which once it is liquid outside uh, in the in the syringe and once injected at the body at uh, the body temperature inside it forms a gel and you can see in the left hand side you can form uh, scaffolds which have a semi permeable uh, 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 potential where in, in, in autoimmune cells cannot come in but the other 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 nutrient can exchange happen and the islands are uh, surviving in this we did an extensive study to understand the survivability of the islets that were encapsulated the functionality of the islets as you can see in the functional studies where you know on uh, uh, you know, on 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 different week basis at a long for long time we have observed insulin glucagon all of those to be produced in enough quantity to take care of at least in the animal model that we have worked also we looked at the simulation index because uh, fasting uh, high glucose and low glucose is very very important and the cells which were respond which were introduced should be responsive to that so a gold standard says 1.5% uh, index so what uh, 1.5 index so we have reached 1.5 which shows that these are very very similar to or what our human islets would behave and have a simulation index of 1.5 so that was with that encouragement we again what we did was another question that we had answered was because it is an implant can we create around the uh, you know injection site a more amenable environment for the acceptability of the graft because that is something which we wanted so that we can have more of m2 so it's it's a, it's a concept of macrophage polarization to more m2 rather than m1 for acceptance of this so we we use a lot of interleukins in dexamethasone which are known to be modulating these macrophages and what now we have is uh, something where it's a cocktail where the gel carries the immunomodulatory factors the cells along with it so it, through a syringe a minimally invasive manner it can be injected at the site and it would create, create a semi permeable membrane it keep on constantly producing insulin glucagon you know and then through the blood vessels angiogenesis you know natural angiogenesis that happens within a few days time the 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 it carries to the systemic circulation and that is how it is able to you know go to the uh, blood and regulate so this is what we have now you know in the animal system now we are doing more of animal studies you know in terms of creating you know uh, uh, diabetic rats uh, through chemical induction and then bringing the blood level uh, uh, sugar level to normalcy and keeping them for the longest period possible so the whole concept is instead of synthetic insulin the patients can we have this as a alternative method where the patient can go to the clinic just one injection in the belly region and uh, maybe for few years there is no need for the patient to take on synthetic injections that's the concept we are proposing through biological system now moving forward uh, 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 forward uh, uh, wound healing and skin care uh, skin grafts are something which is one of the core areas and we have invested heavily in terms of understanding and creating products technological products uh, for, uh, for this domain and dimple was working previously you know as my phd student and again this is a 7 uh, 1/2 years of work that i'm sharing and she is now a postdoc in us where we have developed different concepts i'm going to, i'm not going to give you details of the different concepts but the entire uh, the summing up is where we have developed potential solutions for you know gels which can take care of non healing wounds in terms of diabetic wounds uh, you know particularly and also scaffolds and as well as as an implants uh, gels which can bring back the skin in third degree burn patients so we use a lot of combinations of materials along with silk and this is a gist slide where it shows we form a gel using a non cross linking method a green method where additives are added extracellular matrices are added and when it is applied onto the skin both third degree burn it can able to recreate or or allow the cells to be recruited from the deep down the tissue and we can get the skin back and it has been compared with the gold standard which is the collagen and we have found very similar results you know in in the in vivo studies that we have, uh, have have looked at if you look at the wound closure it is within uh, 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 less than 10 days time we have complete wound closure and when we look at the immune response we found it to be a compatible material we have early angiogenesis and similar to collagen meaning blood vessels for non healing wounds we all know angiogenesis is something which is very critical and it, it this material allows lot of blood new fresh blood vessels to be formed which allows 
the regeneration to happen faster. And if you look at the wound revitalization and the different layers, you can see cytokeratin 10, 14, you can see a very thick layer of that being formed. And comparison to collagen, it is equivalent or even sometimes in cases, it is you know uh, better. That gives us a lot of confidence in terms of this being an alternative uh, wound care products where it can uh, regenerate the wound site you know, uh, and take care of the wounds at a, at a very early uh, uh, healing, not only for chronic acute, but diabetic wounds. And this is another very interesting thing that we observed is uh, healing of the wounds and that too in a scarless fashion. And that is because possible because not only the collagen, different kind of collagen, we can find elastin reticulin expressions to be much, much higher like the native skin and they're all remodeled in a very nice way. And that is something which is very exciting for us. And we are taking these technologies, we have transferred some of these technologies to the industry where the whole concept is uh, uh, in terms of a tube, it will come and the patient can apply onto the wound either for third degree burn or for you know, a diabetic uh, uh, wound healing. And it can be for a graft, which can be going into the burn patients for regeneration of the skin. Now we are working on on uh, on a future direction where uh, using uh, uh, electrical actuation, we are developing wearable devices which would, uh, without the use of growth factors, would regenerate the skin. We have developed a pre-prototype now, and we have got funding from ET, and we are now uh, uh, in the in the coming years we are planning to have this as a wearable device which would be able to. Uh, help regeneration of the skin. These are some of the papers you know, where you can refer to uh, for the wound healing concept. Again, I'll quickly go through some of the 3D printing tissues, a uh, few of them, uh, uh, before I sum up. So uh, this is a problem statement where Bibhas, who just finished his PhD, worked on intervertebral disc. We all know IVD or intervertebral disc is between the vertebra that we have and it acts as a cushion. It helps in balancing the body and, and, and now it, 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 it is one of the most beautiful structures that you have which is very functional yet very complex. So our understanding was that in case of you know, disc herniation which is very common as slip disc where the, the layers get eroded in the AF region and the nucleus pulposus you know, extrude out uh, you know, and pressurizing on the nerves leading to excruciating pain, can this be created in the laboratory or not? The so biggest challenge was not only this is a ring, simple ring-like structure, but they have a cross-aligned 30-degree structure, which is very important for them being a soft tissue yet behaving like a hard tissue. So we wanted to replicate that in total, and we initially did with uh, uh, the device that we have created for, for which we have an US patent, but we realized that you know, if we do this, we may not be able to cater or bring or make enough number of intervertebral discs which, which, you know, uh, and replicate them. So now we have resorted to making in through 3D bioprinting where the dimensions can be taken from the patients and within less than 30 minutes, we can now create you know, these intervertebral discs both cellular as, as and as cellular using stem cells patients autologous stem cells, we can create them. And these are very viable in terms of mechanical, in terms of biological you know, uh, consequences we have looked at in terms of biocompatibility. Now we are doing more of the animal studies to validate this you know, in terms of functionality. So this is what is, is the story for the intervertebral disc. The last one is on the bioengineered knee meniscus, similar to the IVD. The knee meniscus is a soft tissue, which is a load bearing tissue. Uh, in, it is avail it is it is in in fact you know in between joints of all bones but majorly in between the long bones in the legs and we it is a c-shaped structure now uh, it is a problem statement for people who are injured more uh, uh, prominently because of the active high end activity sports injuries uh, because of osteoarthritis related issues and, uh, uh, and 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 there is no gold standard uh, treatment for them unless there is a uh, 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 surgery which would to remove the uh, uh, tearing, uh, tear, tear, torn out tissue. Now what is available in the market are either plastic or polymer based interventions and the best implant is available is in the form of collagen which again unfortunately started to fail after two years of being released to the market. So with this understanding we, we, we started to think then can we have an alternative you know, uh, meniscus which would be mechanically resilient, biologically similar, you know, hierarchical buildup and it will be fully functional. So after understanding the critical structures, we have now recreated this in the in the using bio bio printing 
where we recreated all the three layers of the intervertebral disc. We have shown cellular growth proliferation using stem cell differentiation, and it can be taken through a cellular mode as well. The mechanics are comparable to the, the human uh, meniscus. We have looked into all those aspects. Compatibility also we have, we have evaluated. Now we are looking at the animals testing, which, which, which we, where we want to use in the large animals uh, like goats and sheep. And we want to test them for validation and, 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 and future cycles. So with this, I would like to end. And these are some of the cover pages uh, that uh, have come up from the work. And because a lot of audience, uh, young audience are there. So uh, this is a message which probably Professor, late Professor Rinti Banerjee also, also used to say that, you know, and this, is the, this was the motto that, you know, we should work towards translation, which is answering some of the potent problems the humanity is facing in the healthcare or in allied, allied fields. Second is we should be, you know, uh, not only publishing, but also, uh, you know, realizing the potential of the IPR, protecting them through the IPR and also in technology transfer because it has to reach to the, to the end, right, to the, to the, to the needy. That's the whole goal, uh, sole goal for us to be as researchers. Unless that is done, it is an incomplete cycle. So we take efforts not only to publish our papers, but also to patent that you know, and technology transfer to the industries where they have taken one product is already in the market and few are in the pipeline uh, to be taken forward. A lot of encouragement from uh, both government and, and, and uh, other agencies for the work uh, uh, where Honorable Education Minister, both the current and, and, and ex-ministers have released some of the products to the market, some of the national highlights that has come up. And this is very essential because most of the time we do research and we are bounded by or we are known to people who are our colleagues that are working on the same domain. But unless it reaches to the common people, you know, who are uh, who are actually uh, getting hope uh, from the science and the encouragement comes from them, and then it is very, very useful. So this this uh, this science communication to the audience is very useful, you know, in terms of getting the right feedback, in terms of giving the right signals and letting the world know and the country know that uh, you know, um, uh, there are research groups uh, across India who are trying to help uh, you know, and come out with solutions for the, very, the potent problems that we face. And these are, uh, apart from this, as I said, you know, we heavily work with industries and uh, uh, we have transferred these technologies. These are some of the technologies uh, that are already in the market and which are, which are technology licensed uh, uh, from our laboratory at IIT Guwahati. And uh, before I end, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the entire group, the young group who has been putting their heart and soul. And as I said, it has been only 10 years. And since we started, a lot of uh, ups and downs. But uh, as, as Professor Banerjee used to say, you know, that this is what encourages all researchers you know, towards, uh, towards the common goal of uh, serving our society. And of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, the funding agency, our collaborators across the globe uh, uh, who have had the confidence in us and are collaborating with us. And, and I would like to take on this opportunity to uh, uh, you know, tell youngsters that please uh, do not shy away from uh, collaborating because it is better than reinventing the wheel, collaborate with the like-minded people you know, and then you know, learn from each other and move, uh, you know, move the cycle in a faster pace so that it can have a potential you know, translation at the early stage. And um, unfortunately, I have to give this talk on online. But again, and if you face, uh, if you come to IIT Guwahati, this is the campus I belong to. Very beautiful campus. We take pride, you know, in terms of the beauty that we have uh, surrounded, uh, we are surrounded with, and there's a glimpse of the uh, the community that uh, uh, we we stay here and the campus. Please, if you visit IIT Guwahati, please do feel free to email me, meet me, and I'll be happy to help you in whatever possible way. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank Professor you. Mandal, for this wonderful talk. We as students of Professor Banerjee, we are delighted to see you talk about this field of research. Uh, like, uh, thank you so much. And uh, the something is happening to this video, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if we are audible, we would just request the audience to, if you have any questions, to please put forward mm -hmm. to um, Professor Mandal. You can unmute yourselves and ask on this forum. Thank you.
do we have any questions from the audience? Mm. Uh, if not, then uh, sir, I am um, Abhinanda. I am the coordinator of this track. So I wanted to ask a question to you. In one of your uh, slides, you spoke about wearable devices for skin regeneration. So recently from this lab, like unfortunately post MAM's death, we could publish it. We get, got a review published on wearable devices for drug delivery and this in biomaterials. So there when we were uh, doing some literature search, we found there were a, a lot of challenges to combine this uh, tissue engineering part or the drug delivery part with the wearable device architecture. So sir, uh, could you just throw some light upon how the challenges can be overcome to bring such devices to the market and for easy use for people for using wearable devices for drug delivery or tissue engineering for that matter. Yeah, thank you Avinanda. A pleasure meeting you. And of course, as you said, um, this is something which which is uh, you know, something very uh, important you know, and then probably catered to a great number of audience, right? And uh, and uh, my transition from tissue engineering to wearable device uh, is is like the last three four years now, because uh, at IIT Guwahati uh, we have one more up, question. Uh, we'll thank the presenter Abhu, and then we'll have the next presenter. Uh, Anirudh, yeah, Anirudh, uh, are you speaking? Thank you. Yeah, please mute yourself for a moment. Uh, we are hearing. Yeah, yeah, sir, yeah. you can continue. So, yeah, so what, what uh, as I was saying, so uh, we have a great setup here at IIT Guwahati. As one thing, two, two challenges as you talk about. One is the how you smartly, you know, devise a way so as to you know make sure that the science happens as well as the electronics part are integrated together. Because here two things happen. One is where you are tweaking the biological cells and making them to helping them to regenerate right and another part is the something which is the electronics part where you have to develop uh, the electronic board and the circuitry in a way so that the electric impulses can be given in a cyclic way so we have now uh, now uh, had this challenge of 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 optimizing the the the, the exact current and the voltage which we have done now and we are now uh, 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 have a prototype where we could actuate the wound site and could uh, you know regenerate the cells. And 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 the other the challenge was can we make it affordable? Because these technologies which are uh, you know explored in the West and you know the, they are very very expensive. And and the challenge for us was can we create something which is super affordable? And um, that is where we were breaking our head, and you know, unfortunately, we could come out with ways where we have a prototype which is the, uh, less than a thousand rupees, and you know, and one-time investment, you know, and can kind of you know go for years and years. So, uh, but again, of course, these are early results that we have got. We are now, you know, as I said, funding from METI, and now uh, it's a four-year grant. We'll do a lot of animal trials and the trials in you know, in the in the clinics before we bring it to the market, but. Uh, but these are the challenges, you know, which 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 we faced, and uh, of course, this is part and parcel of any research. Yeah, I thank have you one so question. much. Sir. Uh, yeah. yeah. So next, uh, is is there a question by someone? Yeah, I have one question. Yeah, you can, can I go, go ahead. Please? Yeah. Uh, hello, hello, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Arun Kumar. Uh, very nice talk. Very insightful talk, sir. Thank you for that. I am. So uh, I have one question like uh, silk protein looks to be very, uh, very exciting, very interesting. So uh, but uh, is there any attempts to make silk protein in a biotechnological way using recombinant technology? Uh, and if there is, if you have tried that, how successful was it? Uh, OK, uh, yeah, that's one question you want to ask. Right. So uh, of course, there are ways and means using molecular biology techniques to express protein. And that is what the world has been doing, right? You know, all the recombinants because because the whole point was that can we make this in bulk in large quantities, right? Can we purify them, you know, and to the level where it can be used for human translation and application, right? To my understanding. And also, can this be made in a way which is affordable, yeah. right? 
so these are the three verticals where people industry started to work on and they and they chose the method now for silk uh, now luckily uh, the other way around because where now you have few thousands of metric tons of this pure protein available by nature itself so you know so uh, one cocoon of silk would be 1.5 gram of silk purified silk and that is available in less than 5 rupees right so uh, and and uh, of course as i said the problem statement what was was for other recombinant proteins or other proteins is not for this because you have a highly purified protein which you get from silkworms which you get from cocoons and the extraction methods are fairly you know easy and i said one of the forms has already been given fda approval and some of these are already used in humans and they are in trials so it has been extensively looked upon the biocompatibility and you know, all right so there is no need for you know this proteins to be exported through the express through the other alternative routes also if somebody wish to do there are many groups which are looking at spider proteins for example spider silk proteins now they are very interesting in terms of the resilient the resilient you know uh, the mechanical forces they have and some of the other properties they have now why because spiders cannot be cultured you know you know they are cannibalistic they will kill each other right so yeah. there people have looked at you know sm uh, small domains of spider silk which they have expressed through the you know different uh, you know roots right and but they cannot they could not bring it to the market because the final product is so expensive that you know uh, it is not viable method right oh. though the material is hugely beneficial in terms of properties they have so there is always a balance of what you want to get right and what is the final outcome and how you going to use it so silk silkworm silk particularly has this advantage uh, but of course one can do but uh, uh, to me what i am trying to explain is there is no need because you can get highly purified huge 1000 metric tons of it and directly from the nature okay great okay okay thank you sir Uh, thank you so much, Arun Kumar. So uh, we have and Professor Mandal as well. So we do we have any more questions? We can take a couple of more questions before we end the session. Mm. Anything else? Okay. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Anirudh. Um, you need to unmute yourself, Anirudh. Did we mute? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Anirudh, we can't hear you. Uh. You can uh, ask a question in the chat actually. We can't hear you. You can unmute and mute again, mute and unmute again and try once. Yeah. Uh, uh, no question, ma'am. No okay, no question. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, Rajkumar, uh, sir, I have one last question. Hello, uh, sir? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, so in one of the in one of the projects where you have uh, developed a device scaffold containing cells for uh, clearing the plug like you have used right so where there is a, a season of that uh, particular plaque place where you will be putting the scaffold so that uh, blood curve will be very clear in the initial slides uh, yeah yeah so yeah. actually so, it is yeah actually it is not uh, for it's not a stent so it is a blood vessel implant which would be which where the occluded part would be removed through surgery and this would be replaced with that through suturing so yes, that is the whole proposal yeah yeah sir so uh, my question here is that in the video you have shown that it's like a more of a porous scaffold like which is loaded with the cells which will be replaced in that place so uh, my question is that uh, near the heart or else near that uh, capillaries blood flow will be very uh, high because of the pump and uh, pumping action so will it be like uh, because of that porous will it be there any leakage of rbcs or else any other cellular materials because yeah thank you uh, so there are two as i said uh, in, during my talk there are two ways which we where we try to intervene one is cellularized 
So in the cellularized one, what we do is we culture endothelial cells in the inner layer. So once we culture endothelial cells and we mature them in the bioreactors, they are no more porous. So there is a constant lining of endothelium, which is like the native blood vessel. So, so once there that is achieved, so there is no porosity and the blood can flow without with minimum of, of resistance, right? And that is similar to the native blood-like structure, oh. right? So there, there are all these problems of you know, RBCs leaking out and, you know, and other uh, diffusion uh, uh, problems are addressed already. In the what we realize, something to be created cellularized and taking it to the you know, patient is a long drawn process because in our regulatories, uh, the, if you look at the regulatories and and the, you know, and the hurdles, you know, if you are culturing cells, even autologous, then there are a lot of restrictions in terms of use and processes on the on the process, right? So it's a long drawn process. But so we thought, you know, can we can we can we like the graphs that were available in the market, which are cellular, but uh, those cellular graphs do not allow cellular recruitment, right? And do not allow native blood vessel formation with time. They are, remain as polymers. So our inten intention was in a cellular grafts where can we bridge this gap initially and this acts as a template The native cells from the blood vessels which have been cut and where this implant is transplanted would migrate towards this blood vessel and the cells would uh, be recruited and then we'll have an endothelial layer, smooth muscle cell and fibroblastic layer. And that is what we did. And after two, two months of implantation, we found as I showed in the slide, this uh, all the extracellular matrices were built. There was no leakage observed, and we got extracellular matrices as like a native blood vessels. So that is uh, this is what we have observed, and there was no problem of patency as well because these were uh, suturable through the microvascular surgery uh, as by surgeons. Okay, sir. So there is no sealing. I mean, there will be official no. sealing. No, no, no. We 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 took care of because otherwise it will be a non-functional one. So we Understood. took care of all those and there would be no thrombosis. There would be, you know, because those are the potential problems uh, which yeah. is found in a blood vessel because of, of, of the contact with the blood. Right. So all those has been taken care of and it has been made in a way that we, we address those problems. Thank you very much, sir. It was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the session. So I think uh, we are out of time right now. So we have just, I think somebody has asked a question about what precautions we need to take while developing any device to be used externally for drug delivery. So I think it's the last question. You can just address in short if, uh, if there is anything you yeah, want. Yeah, so precautions in the sense, uh, if it is an external device and if it is for drug delivery, I think the precaution should be that if the device should be enough precise so that the accurate dose of drug can be delivered at the site, right? And also, if it is sequential delivery, then of course the amount and you know, all the time and all those should be very, very precise because it is somebody's health and life we are talking about, right? So, uh, and also, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I think from the health perspective, this is the this is what is very important. If it is an external device, if it is an internal device, of course, it has to be biocompatible, you know, immunologically, you know, it has to be inert and accepted by the you know the body so that it can be grafted. So all those all those points will come. Okay, thank you so much. So we will uh, share uh, Professor Mandel's email ID also on the chat box. So we have one or one or other question, I think very specific to cell form. So you can get in touch with Professor sure. Mandel and he'll get back to you, Anirudh. So we have to move ahead with the session. Thank you so much, sir. And we look forward to being connected with you in future as well. So thank you so much. Yeah. Take care. So are the participants for the posters here? So we just want to 